Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Institute of Politics. My name is Iris Chang, and I'm a first year at the college studying government and, econ and economics, as well as a member of the J JFK Jr. Forum Committee. Before we begin, please take a brief moment to note the two exits on the park and JFK street sides of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit nearest to you and congregate at the JFK Park. Please also now take a moment to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Leo Barrera. Good evening. Uh, my name is Leo Barrera. I'm a senior here at the College Studying Government. Uh, I'm also serving as the president of Harvard Rad Radcliffe Raza, which is the oldest uh, Latina affinity group at the college. Um, I'm honored to be here with all of you for the special event uh, here at the forum in recognition of Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, I have the privilege of standing in front of you today because I stand on the shoulders of these titans, which you will all meet in a second, that came before me, of trailblazers in our Hispanic community, of role models that make me proud to be a Latino and a first-generation college student at Harvard. Tonight's conversation will focus on social and economic mobility with an emphasis on first-generation journeys. Our guests tonight are Congressman Joaquin Castro, Commissioner Alejandra Campoverde, and Brandy Collins Dexter. Congressman Joaquin Castro represents Texas's 20th district. A native of San Antonio, Congressman Castro is now in his sixth term in the U.S. House of Representatives. Congressman Castro serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Prior to his election to Congress, he graduated from Stanford University and got his JD at Harvard Law before working in private practice and then serving five terms in the Texas legislature. Alejandra Campoverde is a former commissioner for the California Children and Families Commission, also known as First Five California, and appeared in the PBS documentary Inheritance, named one of the best documentaries of 2020 by Elle magazine. A graduate of the Kennedy School of Government, she served in the Obama White House, initially as special assistant to the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy, and later as White House Deputy Director of Hispanic Media. Her, book, her new book, First Gen, is a memoir about navigating social mobility as a first gen Latina. Our moderator this evening is Brandy Collins Dexter, the former senior campaign director at Color of Change, where she oversaw the media, culture, and economic justice departments. She's a regular commentator in the media on racial justice and was named 2017's Person to Watch by The Hill and one of the 100 most influential African Americans by The Root in 2019. She is currently a visiting fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. I want to take this moment to thank the Har Harvard Kennedy School's Shorenstein Center for Media, Politics, and Public Policy for co-sponsoring this event. Now, without further ado, please join me now in welcoming our guests for this evening's forum. Hi, everyone. I'm excited for this conversation. Um, Welcome back to Harvard, y'all. Thank you. How are you feeling? What's coming up for you being back? I mean, I got here yesterday, and I immediately was drawn to the Charles and went and sat on the bench that I used to sit in, like, God, almost 20 years ago, and just kind of watch the rowers and still have that feeling that I had back then, which was so much bigger than you know, just going to grad school. It was, it was kind of this generational moment of like, consequence. It's profound. So I always love coming back here. It feels very visceral. Uh, just how old I feel and how young everybody looks here, <laughs> mostly. Uh, I had a chance to go by the law school. My brother Julian and I graduated from Harvard Law School in 2000, and everything's changed over there. It was all different. Um, but I have not been back here, I think, since like 2018, mm. uh, pre-pandemic. So it's been like five years. So it's good to be back on campus. Nice, nice. Um, Tonight is a celebration, and I, there's a lot of stuff we're going to get into. Um, there's a lot I want to talk about and uplift. But also, 
it's, it's been a week, right? There's been, <laughs> there's been some things that have happened in, um, in Congress, and so, you know, it would be remiss of me not to um, just ask you, Congressman, um, like, what, what's going on right now? What does this moment mean um, for our country with the removal of the Speaker of the House? And what would you like to say right now? Yeah, well, first, we need a new speaker in case any of you want to run for speaker in Washington. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it's the first time in American history that the speakership has been vacated. Uh, you think about that. It, I'm in my 11th year in Congress. And it struck me as we were sitting there, and they call the final vote, what it means for the country, for the Congress to be at that level of dysfunction. Um, and you know, I'm a Democrat from Texas, so take my words for what they're worth. Uh, but to me, as the more extreme folks within the Republican Party have taken hold of the party itself within Congress, it's gotten harder for them to elect speakers who can both govern and keep the basic functions of government running and also satisfy the demands of those far-right leaders. And Kevin McCarthy tried to do both last week, and so he's no longer the speaker for the House of Representatives. Um, you know, there's other far-right folks that are being considered, Steve Scalise, who's the number two, Jim Jordan, uh, and even Donald Trump, I think, is gonna be nominated, apparently. Uh, so. I don't know how it all ends. Um, it took 15 rounds of voting last time, uh, yeah, 10 months ago, to get it to, to finally elect a speaker. And I think it could go for a while this time as well. Mm -hmm. You guys both got into politics young. Um, and I want to talk about that a little bit. But if you were, so there might be some people here who could be Speaker of the House. So if you were to put out a wanted ad, for Speaker of the <laughs> House, <true. laughs> what, what would you years, have? 15 years, 20 years, yes. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about your journey, both to the stage and um, Alejandro, your journey in writing the book. I'd love to hear from both of you, like your story and your journey. Please. Well, the story to writing the book, I'll start with that because they're very intertwined. It is a memoir, even though the memoir I like to describe is kind of being the anti-memoir because it's a broader story that a lot of us share around the economic toll, or excuse me, the emotional toll of economic and social mobility for first-gen young people. But it actually was kind of born of a seed in Harvard because I was speaking at a Latinx graduation. I was there with the students and getting ready to give that, I did it so you can too, kind of speech. And it struck me that it felt so incomplete. And the way that you're often introduced and those kind of bullet points of your resume that tend to be read before you come out on stages like this, it felt like it kind of glossed out a lot of like the realness and a lot of what really happens when you're going through this journey. And so I wanted to write a book that was the spaces between those bullet points, right? Because that's where the real story lies. Mm -hmm. And that's where the real, the real grit, the real sacrifices, the real scars live. And so I changed the way that I gave that speech. And when I started seeing the reaction of the young people I was talking to, which there were tears, but it, it seemed like tears of release and relief, if anything, because this experience is so isolating and it can feel really lonely. And, but it's so widespread. So there was this weird dichotomy. I, I remember when I, landed here at the Kennedy School. I was 26 years old. And I grew up in LA, raised by a single mom who had immigrated from Mexico. And I had never lived anywhere other than LA. And at the time, I was dealing with a pretty acute panic disorder that had started in my, my childhood, tied together with a lot of trauma that I had experienced, both generational and you know, in, in my own dynamic with my family. And coming here kind of cracked that all open in a really good way. I was able to face that down and also find a sense of belonging here. And I know we're gonna get into a lot of that. So I'll leave it there. But this arc of this story, a lot of it happens here. And so I'm excited to dive into that. Uh, well, you know, first I wanna be here tonight to support Alejandra and her book because I think it's remarkable and her story is remarkable. Uh, and it resonates with so many folks within the Latino community in the Mexican-American community. Um, and, 
you know, my story is somewhat similar of a different location, Texas instead of California. Uh, I grew up in San Antonio and I'm actually second generation Mexican American and it was my grandmother that came from Mexico all, about 101 years ago now uh, because she came as a six or seven year old orphan. Um, her parents had died around the time of the Mexican Revolution and the closest relatives that could take her and her younger sister in were not in Coahuila, Mexico, but were in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And when my grandmother got to Texas, there were still signs that said no dogs or Mexicans allowed. And it was uh, illegal to speak Spanish in schools. So that's the world that my grandmother came into in Texas. So it was my mom that was actually the first in her family to graduate from high school, to go to college, to get involved in politics. And my brother and I, uh, my parents were together until I was eight. Um, but we grew up in a household of two parents that were very involved in the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement in San Antonio in trying to get more people to vote, in trying to elect Latino and Latina candidates to office. My mom ran for city council when she was 23 years old as a young woman. Um, and you know, so I grew up believing that when government works right, it can help create opportunities in people's lives. And I'm in my 21st year of public service, 10 years in the state legislature in Texas, and my 11th year in Congress. And I still fundamentally believe that. Hmm. I think that's actually really interesting, if I may, because what, how different this entry point was. Mm -hmm. Because growing up for me, it was very much about survival, right? And, and making ends meet. And it almost felt like politics and, and voting and all of this, it didn't have a seat at our table. A lot of times everyone was working, we didn't have a table that we all went and sat at. So it was really interesting because a, a lot of my introduction to this was you know, in the 90s in LA, Proposition 187 mm. and you know, the LA riots. Mm. And it was almost like the activism of this kind of injustice that we weren't vo old enough to vote, but we all had these like buttons on our bags. And so feeling that something had to change, but not having a sense of agency for how to even do that, or even kind of even understand how one ends up sitting in rooms like these. Yeah, I mean, it was, so I, I both, when I found out I had to do this, um, I got the privilege of doing this. Um, I had to kind of like speed through, so I was both reading and listening to First Gen. And I think when I dove into it, um, I knew it was gonna be great. I don't think I was quite as much expecting for so much of it to resonate with me because, as you said, our stories are all different in different ways. Like, for example, my family's been here since the 1600s, and yet a lot of the themes that you pull out of there, it resonated with me. And there was this passage that I sort of like highlighted um, that I wanna read and talk about. And it says, um, to be a first and only in America is a delicate balance of surviving where you come from while acting like you belong where you're going. Success in the former does not make the latter any easier. In fact, the more effective you are at surviving, the larger the experience gap there is to bridge. But in reality, first and onlys aren't crossing a bridge at all. We are the bridge, painstakingly stretched from where we come from to where we hope to arrive. The trailblazer toll is the emotional cost of social and economic mobility. It's the tax we pay to become the proverbial bridge. And that was like, that was like for me. And um, even just that frame, trailblazer, trailblazer toll, just really stuck with me. Talk a little bit to me about like how you came up with that term. What does that mean for you? Well, I wanted to name it. And not because I am the expert on trauma or sociology or a psychologist or any of these things, and I say very clearly in the book that I don't have this figured out, but you can't heal from that which you don't name. And a lot of us have these similar experiences, and we know that anecdotally, and, and we, when we connect with each other, we talk about it, but a lot of times we focus on certain parts of it. The imposter syndrome part gets a lot of play, right? You're almost like told about it since you're young, you know, the imposter syndrome's gonna come. You're just kind of like, okay, you know, and, and it, a lot of things are kind of blamed on the, uh, that. And I'm not, val I'm not invalidating that it is a thing. It, it is something that a lot of, all of us, including me, have struggled with. At the same time, there's so many other components that some of them pre-birth and some of them past our, the time when we reach these pinnacles. 
there's a breakaway guilt sometimes of making more money than your family, family members and maybe coming home from the holidays and kind of trying to navigate what that feels like when your life has drastically changed. You know, you're, you're sitting here hearing from Congressman Castro. Like, I remember <laughs> sitting where you guys are and going like, Psh, I can't believe these people are here, you know? And that doesn't get as much play when we talk about this experience, which I think is a detriment, because these aren't, these aren't things that are validated with us in a way that makes it so, makes it more complicated to process. And then you end up in spaces where you reach these different pinnacles, and I know I'll speak for myself here, you know, you kind of reach these summits and you're like, God, why don't I feel more happier? Why do I mm -hmm. feel conflicted? Or like, what is this stuff? And so this book is not an answer so much as the opening of a conversation to normalize the first gen experience in a way that is dynamic and nuanced because that's what it is. I remember sitting right there on our first day of orientation for my MPP in 2006. And I was feeling the imposter syndrome piece, absolutely. I was sitting there looking around and there were like boat shoes going on and scars and all these things. And I was like, oh my God, how do I, how do I fit here? And I remember the dean at the time came up here and he said, you know, I'm gonna start with saying one thing. Everyone here is probably thinking they don't belong and I want to tell you one, and maybe they made a mistake with your application, but Harvard doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> so if you're here, trust me, Harvard didn't make a mistake, you belong here. And like there was this collective like sigh in the crowd, right? And that's one of those moments that stuck out to me, that how many of us were actually thinking the exact same thing. Wow. I'm still sitting with Harvard doesn't make mistakes, by the way. <laughs> Um, no mistakes with any of you. There's been some mistakes. You know what? It, but in this situation, <laughs> I think we should all accept that, right? And I did not make any mistakes. <laughs> Didn't make any mistakes, yeah. Um, Congressman, you, were there any things in the book for you that kind of like struck you in that way and resonated with your own? Well, journey? just that experience, you know, also, I went to school, I went to Stanford, so I went to school in California when all of that Prop 187 debate was going on, mm -hmm. but also the anti-affirmative action debate, mm -hmm. that whole era in the mid-90s. So just to read about the experience of somebody actually growing up in that environment, um, I, I kind of felt a bit like an interloper, right, because I was from Texas. I had grown up um, in a different place. Uh, so that was very interesting. And just, of course, all the issues of identity and family struggle and um, you know those things that, that many of us experience with different ways, in different ways. Uh, the unspoken thing among family members, uh, the things that you, you know, like the distances between parents and siblings and so forth, um, you know, some of which I think even in my own family are still unresolved. Yeah, so to, to be able to read about somebody else's journey was, was great. Hmm. I commissioned a poll when I was writing this book because, again, we know all this is true. Right, I see by the nodding heads that we know this is true. And you know, we're data people, so we commissioned a national poll, and when we looked at whether or not um, the first-gen student experience had a negative impact on your emotional and mental health, 65% said yes, which is not a surprise. And the reason, though, was interesting. When we asked the reason, the imposter syndrome part was at the floor, right? Number one, financial trauma. Mm. Yeah. And number two. Oh, I thought that was somebody. Being I know, like, I did. Yes. I was like, someone was really Financial being like, trauma. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and number two was loneliness and isolation. And so, part of these conversations, why this is so wonderful that the IOP is holding space for this conversation, is that part. Because for such a widespread experience to be so isolating from not only our peers here, but from our families you know, from our friends. I lost, I, I tell a story in the book about losing my best friend when I came to Harvard because, you know, I don't know if any of you guys have had this experience, but I'd be like, come visit, or let me tell you about it, and I could just tell she didn't want to talk about it, and, and finally she blurted, I don't, want to, I don't want to visit your snotty friends. I don't want to meet them. And so I started kind of keeping that part of my life away, 
and all that did would kind of create more and more distance and if you feel that you did something wrong and mm -hmm. and that's another part of it. I mean, we could talk about this for hours. Yeah, we could. <laughs> um, you and I, so I, I wrote a book as well that came out last year called Black Skinhead, and it, it, there were a lot of themes in it around isolation, but also finding family, finding history, tracing my genealogy. It was, it was like, and to do that during 2020 where there's like the shutdowns and you're kind of like in isolation, but you're also finding all of these parts of yourself. And so when I was reading your book as well, there was, there was so much of that in there and I'd love for you, especially um, for folks who haven't yet had a chance to read it, to talk about like, what was the hardest part of writing this book and what were some of the breakthroughs you had as you were writing this book? Do folks know what a genogram is? I learned about what a genogram was when I was actually here in a class. And a genogram is a family tree, but of emotions, right? Of emotional inheritances. It's the first trailblazer tool, our visible inheritances. And it's a way that you can kind of map out the relationships between people and your families, whether it's love or it's control or neglect or manipulation, whatever it was, romantic relationships and familial relationships. And I learned about that here and was really able to take a step back and look at these kind of cyclical dynamics that happen in our families. And when I did that and really saw that very clearly, it was, it was more clear than ever the way that a lot of times our traumas are intertwined with our family members. And when I was writing this book, that was the hardest part because there were certain stories that you will see are very intimate to me, but are very intimate to my mother and in telling some trauma that I went through, I was also telling her story, and I felt a real sense of responsibility. Because with a lot of this experience, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes validating our own experience feels like we're betraying our families, right? So how to tell my story without pointing fingers or blaming or shaming or embarrassing someone in my family? So I asked my mother, I told her, Let me, can I read everything to you before I kind of finalize the text? And she said, okay, and it was so activating mm -hmm. for both of us. There's one scene in particular I won't give away, but it's a scene that borderlines on physical abuse, that we were both there at the time. And I was literally, I mean, we were talking about what it looked like and smelled like and tasted like in so many different ways, and we were both kind of buzzing, and then, it wasn't until, but you know, she didn't ask me to change one thing, which I think was really important. And it wasn't until last week, I was giving a talk at the LA Public Library and it was the first time she had come and she was sitting there. I could tell she was uncomfortable. We know our moms, you know, and they're kind of like, kind of uncomfortable. And when people started asking questions, and this has been happening a lot in this conversation, like we said, the people behind her and the people in front of her started crying. And I could see her face and she was kind of watching and it had to do with a story she was involved with. And she told me afterwards, she's like, I get it now. Telling the truth is healing for me too. Wow. Um, thank you for that. Um, I actually want, can I ask a congressman a question? Yeah, please do. <laughs> no, because I mean, the congressman has this really interesting generational inheritances in his family too, with his mother and the women in his family. And I, I'm kind of curious how you think about this part as well. Yeah, well, I mean, you talk about like the power of women, my family, and also just the lineage. I have my, my, grand, my great grandfather's last name, right? So, my mom doesn't have her dad's last name. Uh, I don't have my dad's last name. So my last name goes all the way back years and years. And I grew up mostly with my mom and my grandmother. Uh, my parents were together until I was eight, like I said. And then my brother and I grew up with my mom and my grandmother. And even their relationship was very complicated. Um, you know, I talked about unresolved things and unspoken things. And, my brother wrote his book a few years back and talked about our family, uh, but there was always tension in that relationship. Um, but, you know, they obviously, they, they both loved us a lot and took care of us, um, but they were very different personalities. And my grandmother was kind of the survivor, uh, keeping her head down. She had come from Mexico. She'd grown up in a place that for a long time was hostile. 
to her and people like her. My mom was very upset about all of it and what she was growing up in. And so she was the, the burst of energy that went into politics and tried to change things. And we kind of grew up in a household with both of those personalities and both of those experiences. Um, you know, and I think that for me, like you mentioned on the politics part, I didn't realize for the longest time that I didn't have a normal experience in that way. And I thought everybody's parents were into voting and marches and protests and everything. And it really took me a while. I mean, I went through college still thinking this was like a normal <laughs> everyday experience. Um, but, you know, but to see those two, as somebody who's in public service now, to see those two very different, like lived experiences, you talk about the immigrant versus the first gen, you know, as a second generation person to observe those two experiences. Uh, looking back, it's taken me years to actually look back on it and see more of it for what it was. And quite honestly, even at 49, I don't think I fully kind of come to the whole picture yet. Uh, but yeah, it was remarkable. Two very strong women in their own way. Um, yeah. See, I think you are first gen. Yeah, yeah, because well, in the book, I expand gen. the definition of first gen <laughs> yeah. a bit because you know we it, it doesn't it doesn't need to only be first generation Americans or first generation children of immigrants. I mean, a lot of us, whether it's first generation students, first generation to break a cycle of poverty, first generation sure. professionals. I mean, first generation to elected office. Those dynamics, a lot of them are in common. Yeah. You know? Oh, absolutely. I think that's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about, um, we have kind of all of these sort of like visible and invisible barriers that can surround us, um, but the financial piece is real, right? And even when you think about getting into politics, like you guys both got into to politics relatively young, even through different journeys, but when you think about how much it costs just to kind of like throw your hat in the ring to potentially run for office or all of these things around leaving school with student debt. I think we're probably going into about the third generation of student debt with people around, you know, in their ages of 20s and now it's like their grandparents have student debt. What are some of the different things that come up around the financial barriers to economic and political mobility that you guys see and experience? And I'd love to start with you, Alejandra. Sure. <clears throat> and that has been a very active part of my experience. I mean, I was a Pell Grant kid in undergrad, um, and I've kind of been, I've been working since I was an early teen. You know, it's just been a responsibility that I've had to make those ends meet and all through college. When I first took my real, my big first real big debt um, was to come here. You know, I, I took on a full student loan package to come here. And at the time, and this is one thing I talk about in the book, you know, people were like, are you crazy? You know, go, go to a different school, you know? And, and folks were dissuading me from doing that. And one of the trailblazer told is this kind of blindfolded cliff jumping, which is this existential level risk. Yeah, we hear all about, you know, take risks, take calculated risks. Well, when you feel that if you fail at what you're doing, not only do you like take yourself down, but you take down the expectations of a fam an entire family, who sees you making their sacrifices worthwhile. I mean, that's a whole level of pressure that's different, right? So I, I made that decision. I remember signing that promissory note and thinking, well, I'll be able to pay it off. You know, I'll be able to pay it off. So I took that, I, and I wouldn't change a thing, to be clear. Um, but when I graduated, and it was June of 08, and all I wanted to do was join the Obama ca campaign. What a great time to graduate from the Kennedy School. I didn't have any money either, you know? Like, I didn't have health care because it had just run out. I had been living off loans that I had just completely spent. And so I did what I thought I could do, which was get a zero APR credit card and start living off of it. And, you know, I took an unpaid position. And again, these are the things that when you hear, she went to Harvard, then she went to the White House, you kind of skip all this, right? Go on to the campaign, and I there's a whole chapter about this and how this looked like, and got 
my wallet robbed the first day, had to ask someone to borrow $20 on my first day on the campaign so I could take the, the, the L train home to the supporter housing where I was staying. And then when we won, went to DC again with no job, no health insurance, no guarantee of anything because I was like, you know, I just want to be there and hopefully get a job. And so coming into politics actually was a huge financial hole for me. And as you know, it isn't like you necessarily get paid all that much once you get there. Now, those were decisions that I made, but it shouldn't have to be so existential in order mm -hmm. to get involved with our political system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you shouldn't have to be taking jobs and working for free or, you know, when you don't have the family support to be able to engender that. But we wonder why campaigns don't always look reflective, right? So that was, that was a, a big part of this and one that I, I know has changed. You know, I, I know that times are different now as far as paying interns and I'm really happy about that and as far as, you know, helping students. But, I mean, it's a big conversation we're having right now about student loans. And I know what a huge, huge weight that can be on your shoulders and make you feel like you can, it really limits the options you have for your life, unfairly. Yeah, I think affordability is part of the reason that uh, you see that Latinos make up a disproportionately smaller share of elected officials, for example, and Latinas especially. Uh, it, it does cost money to be able to oftentimes for a campaign, for example, to put your life on hold and go campaign uh, and hopefully win and then go from there. Um, you know, when I, w when I got ready to go to college, I think my mom had made like $19,000 like the year before my brother and I went to school. And she was, as a single parent, trying to send two sons to school. Um, and, you know, fortunately we got a lot of loans and grants and everything. Um, and then when I decided to run for office, I had been working at a law firm for a year and had saved up probably like $25,000, which was a lot. Growing up, if you told me I had $25,000 in the bank, uh, that was an enormous amount. But I quit my job and decided to run for state representative. And by this time, my brother was on the San Antonio City Council. And I think I put in like $4,000 of that $25,000 of my money to get my campaign going. And I only spent in that first primary, I was taking on a Democratic incumbent, I spent about $26,000 and was able to win the primary and then go from there. Uh, but, you know, looking back, <laughs> I don't, like, uh, you yeah, know, of course I was like single at the time. I was 20, when I started that campaign, I was 26. Uh, for me to try to do that now, it, it's, it, you know, there are things in life that, you know, good things that happen to you, but also good things that can make it tougher for you to take those chances. Um, I mean, they can happen anytime, right? But, um, but yeah, and, and it's a tough situation because we need both more Latinos and Latinas in college, in graduate school, and in politics, all of those, right? But I would say that I hope those of you that do have an interest in public service, uh, whether it is in, as elected officials, or working in politics, that you will pursue it because despite the, the mess of late, uh, it is very much a worthwhile and worthy uh, experience and endeavor uh, and that you can still do good things in people's lives by serving in government in whatever way that you do. And then also just remember this, because the inclination I think for a lot of folks is first to think about running for office you know, I want to be a, a member of Congress or a senator, or I want to run for president one day, whatever it is. Uh, but I think some of the most consequential people, if not the most consequential people in world history and American history never were elected to public office. And Martin Luther King Jr., for example, was never elected to public office. Um, you know, and so Rosa Parks was never elected to public office. Cesar Chavez was never elected to public office. So you can have an incredible impact on policy and on people without ever serving a day with a title in elective office. Mm -hmm. um, we've got about four minutes till we move to questions. Oh, so folks fast. should, yeah, if, if you have those questions, get them ready, get ready to race to a microphone, um, or I'll just keep going. 
Um, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was reading your book and um, even thinking of my own sort of life journey and advice that I hear is I, I, I feel like in my family there were kind of like these dual messages. And so on one hand, it was, there was this thing that was like, you have to work 10 times harder to get twice as far. And then on the other hand, there were these kind of like ideas of, you know, shut up, nobody cares, you can do it, just work for it. And I think as I got older, I started to have some critiques around this idea of the American dream and its accessibility. And I can't remember the exact data points, but I think it's, it's people think it's significantly more likely that they can overcome certain odds to achieve the American dream than is really possible. Like they, the, the likelihood that people can actually like move between classes is actually much um, lower than a lot of people realize. And so I think for me and my work, I think how am I kind of thinking about what are the myths around economic mobility that I don't necessarily want to pass down to future generations? And I'm curious for you guys in your work, what does that look like for you? Well, to me, it looks like adding nuance to this conversation because a lot of us have broken glass ceilings or will go on to break a lot of glass ceilings, but they don't talk about that when you're the one who breaks the glass ceilings, you usually have to clean up all the shards on your own, right? And so painting this picture, you know, is not of this nuance, is not meant to be depressing or demoralizing or discouraging, but to really normalize the conversation about what this really looks like. Because to be prepared in that way, to me, would have helped me know that I wasn't broken or making all these mistakes or having all these missteps or so on. You know, I've actually seen with Harvard students in particular just the same kind of angst about this as with other students who are much younger, maybe not grad students or so on, because you think that, okay, well, you're here at Harvard and you're feeling like you should be on top of the world that you made it, but that, that chasm is even wider for you, right, in a lot of ways because you almost feel like you're ungrateful to, to name these things. Like, who are you to complain? You're at Harvard, right? I remember to the bridge conversation, I was here speaking at a, a leadership for a Latino summit, and this woman came and she was in tears and she said, you know, I don't know how to bridge these things. I don't know how to bridge where I came from and where I'm going and where my family's from and where I'm at now and the social class that I'm at now and these experiences I'm having and then what things are like at home. And what I told her at the time was that she already, she was the bridge. Like she didn't need to do anything. She existed as that bridge with all these different pieces, with the Nike Cortez next to the nice heels next to the boat shoes. Like it all lived in the closet and in the closet of her heart, right? And so there's less of an, an activeness to this idea than what it is that I thought. I thought social mobility was all these different costume changes. And I thought that it was just kind of like skating over thin ice, you know, your speed is your safety. But it actually doesn't have to be that way if we're honest with ourselves and with each other. Because the connections I found in these floors were the ones that sustained me. You know, they're the ones that validated like, oh, I feel that way too, you feel that way too? Oh yeah, I do. And that makes the American dream feel more accessible to me. First gen young people, according to this poll, man, you guys are the most blindly optimistic beyond any odds. I mean, you, you look at all these polls that are going around saying everyone's depressed and thinks the world's gonna end. Not first gen young people. I'm gonna buy a car, I'm gonna buy a house. I'm gonna make more money than my parents. I'm gonna this, 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 this. In the face of all of this financial trauma and isolation, I mean, you guys are the American dream social mobility standard bearers. And it's kind of taking off that idea that you have to morph into something else and really center the fact that you just have to become more of what you already are. Yeah, along those lines, I mean, you know, the, the thi one thing that has always fundamentally bothered me about the concept of the American dream is that it's measured almost strictly in economic and material terms. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, that means that my grandmother never achieved her American dream. 
or so many of our family members never <laughs> achieved their American dream. And so, you know, years ago when my brother was getting ready to speak at the Democratic Convention and we were trying to decide what is the theme of that speech, one of the themes of that speech was that the American dream is more like a relay for many of our families where you're passing on your success, not just materially, uh, but in terms of your family, the love of your family, the relationships, all of it. And I think if you, at least to me, if you define it that way, then it broadens it uh, and it means that more in our community have achieved it. Um, what concerns me about the future is really where we're headed with artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, which is another whole conversation, but what that means for the workforce. And Congress right now is starting to try to work through what regulation looks like. Um, but I know we have questions yeah, from the I audience. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts so. about that. Also, Latanya Sweeney and Sherrod um, Gold will be here next week to actually talk about AI if you're interested. But um, I see two questions. So let's start down here and, and go up here. First question. Hello, my name is Victor Flores. I'm an undergraduate here at the college studying government and ethnicity, migration, and human rights. Also a first generation low income college student and a first generation Salvadoran American. Um, now, at this point, I've interned at every level of government, um, and each time it's reaffirmed my passion for public service, but it has also become more and more discouraging for the feasibility of it. Now, you've been talking about and touching on the financial feasibility of working in public service, and at my standpoint right now, um, a stipend that I get from being a White House intern that doesn't even cover my living expenses, let alone being an intro staff assistant once I graduate on Capitol Hill, that can't even cover my living expenses. How do I actually serve? So my question to you is, in a tangible and substantive way, what are the policies that we can implement to get more first-generation people into public service, more Latinos, more BIPOC folks into these positions? Oh, well, I mean, part of it is quite simple, and we started it a few years ago, which is to actually start paying interns, for example. Um, I was part of a group of folks that led the effort to start doing it in the House of Representatives and then also led the effort to do it at the State Department. Uh, I know the White House does it now. You're right that it's not enough money, but that by itself was a generational breakthrough because for decades there was literally nothing. And unless you could afford to pay for rent in Washington, D.C., and that's if you want to come to Washington, right? You ask the question about how to serve. You don't have to go to Washington to serve, right? Uh, but if you're going to go to Washington, we need to do a better job of, of paying people and making it easier for people to serve there. Any other legislation or anything? Um, question up here. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Kirthi. I'm a sophomore at the college. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my question is about immigrant mobilization um, in terms of getting people to the polls. I'm the first gen daughter of two Indian immigrants. And one thing I can say for sure is that getting my family out to the polls is really difficult every election cycle, especially at the local level, because they feel so powerless. Um, and I think it's really a carry on of what they experienced back home in India. So what can we do to prove to immigrants that their voices matter? Um, and what should we be doing to make sure that at the local level especially, their opinions are really heard? Yeah, well, we know that the younger generations are a big part of getting the older generations to go out and vote, to get engaged. Um, even with health, where I do a lot of health advocacy when it comes to preventive health, when it comes to testing and so on, a lot of times it's us taking our abuelitas to the doctor or encouraging them to go get a mammogram or so on. Um, so on my side, I think a lot of the answer lies with the younger generations and you know, what we've been doing is trying to mobilize community leaders that are trusted in our communities, because you're right, there is a lot of distrust. And it's different when someone who is your neighbor says, listen, there's this person, or there's this proposition, like we need to do this, this is important to our community, versus kind of every number of years seeing some ads that are, that are targeted to us and just feels like, okay, here it comes again, we're important but it doesn't feel as sincere. Yeah, and I think part of the fault of the political parties is that they don't do enough to reach out to new Americans, to immigrants in the country, and to really engage them 
Uh, that's been true in Texas, for example, for the longest time um, with different communities, the Mexican American community, but also the Asian American community around Fort Bend, for example, Texas, for those of you that are familiar with the geography of Texas. Um, and, I, and what's interesting is I think it's, it com you have immigrant communities that are actually wanting to engage, uh, but are either distrustful or don't know exactly how to jump in. And so that's why it requires the extra engagement of political parties to get out there um, and talk to folks. But the incentives in politics are the reverse. The incentives in politics are to talk to the people who are already voting, already engaged in the system, which is quite different than trying to bring new people in, unfortunately. So we have to, and I speak for the Democratic Party, like we have to really commit ourselves um, to doing that. Uh, in a way that we haven't always in the past. I don't know if there's a question up here. I know microphone uh, there's one over here. Okay, question? Hi, uh, my name is Jack, I'm a junior at the college. Uh, thanks so much for the conversation you had. Uh, my question is for Representative Castro, as someone who was involved in the second of the Trump impeachments pretty closely. Before we had all the McCarthy stuff go down this week, last week we had the first Republican impeachment hearing against President Biden, and it seemed like a major theme that Republicans in the Judiciary Committee were trying to advance was that the two Trump impeachments during his administration were essentially political witch hunts. And then what? Political witch hunts. Oh. And then in response, Democrats in the Judiciary Committee last week were characterizing this Republican impeachment as a political stunt. Obviously, there's pretty big substantive differences between the impeachments then and the yeah. impeachment investigation now. But do you think there's a risk that in each future Congress, if there's a difference between the party that has a majority in the House and the president's party, that an impeachment risk being used as, a, as an exclusively political tool to kind of attack the president? Uh, yeah, certainly there's that risk. Um, and that was a conversation for us when, when we went through both impeachments with President Trump, um, is that would it set off this domino effect, for example, of, of like you said, um, parties trying to impeach the other president. Um, the answer is yes, there's a risk, but at the same time, when there are substantive violations of law or things that rise to the level of impeachment, you also can't sit back and do nothing because the risk then is to incentivize presidents to break the law, to believe that they can do anything with impunity. Uh, and so there are risks both ways, but. What you need is to be able to trust that the people you elect in a system, in this case, the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, are going to abide by the rule of law rather than uh, yeah, pursue political grudges. Uh, and you mentioned the substantive difference between the impeachments of President Trump. I was on, I still serve on the Intelligence Committee, so we had parts of the first impeachment, the second impeachment, and then I was on the trial team in the Senate for the second impeachment of Donald Trump. Um, th those impeachments happen because of the direct actions taken by the president. First in uh, you know, trying to coerce Ukraine uh, into you know, a favor for Donald Trump, and then second because of the incitement of the insurrection, as opposed to what you see now with Republicans, which is uh, going after President Biden because of the actions of a family member that's a very, very different thing. Uh, not the president's actions, but the actions they, they suppose of a family member. Uh, and, you know, so I, I hope that the system will right itself, uh, but those are two very different things. Right. So I know we've got a question over here and a question up here. So let's start here and then we'll move to up here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Luis Gaitan. I'm a student at the School of Education, getting my master's. And uh, I have a question regarding narrative. So in this country, the word immigration, it's really weighted. Now I'm originally from El Salvador, I'm a dreamer, now I'm here. And so I'm wondering, you know, we're all here together. Some of us are gonna be leaders in this country one day. How do we influence the narrative regarding immigration and what being an immigrant in this country is when this country was built on immigration? Uh, I mean, that's a great question. Um, well, let me start with this, because I've done a lot of work on it the last four years in particular. I, I really put my foot on the gas on the issue of the Latino narrative, which ropes in the immigrant narrative. 
uh, after the shooting in El Paso, Texas in 2019, where a guy drove 10 hours and killed 23 people because he considered them, quote unquote, Hispanic invaders to Texas. Um, the Latino narrative is mostly missing from the larger American narrative. People don't really know who Latinos are, by and large. Um, so for example, I would ask you to think about your own experience in whatever state you grew up. Uh, how many Latino or Latina f historical figures did you read about in middle school or in high school? You know, if you grew up in California or New York or Florida or maybe Texas, probably a few. I would imagine if you grew up in Iowa or Idaho or Maine or somewhere else, possibly zero. What's very stark about that is that Latinos make up almost 20% of the country and 40% of the two largest states, California and Texas. And so you have this large group of people for whom the story has not been written or told large, widely. So what happens is that the country doesn't know from our community who has contributed anything positively to the success of the country in government, science, business, arts, culture, or just about any other field. What it creates for immigrant Latinos and Latinos, you know, second generation, third generation, and so forth, is that we exist, we, we have been rendered almost ahistorical in the country because you're also not associated with any particular period in American history, right? I mean, what period do you associate the Latino community with? And so there is this, in, in that void of narrative comes all of the stereotypes from mass media and so forth that then get twisted by people in my line of work, by politicians, uh, even further for their own political gain. And what it creates is a very dangerous narrative actually, uh, not just a culturally inconvenient thing, a very dangerous narrative. And that's where you get, that's where you get people targeting immigrants. Uh, and so you ask the question, well, how do you turn that around? How do you change it? Um, really, there's got to be an effort to fill in that, that void of narrative uh, through mass media, through schools, through learning about the contributions of the Latino community and of immigrants and so forth. And that's not like a two-week thing, right? That's like a years-long effort uh, that will be more successful in some places than others. And you're also facing a headwind right now because you have book bans and so forth in different places where they're now, they're taking away that history, right? Like they don't, there's people that don't want you to learn any of that positive history um, or critiques even of American history. Uh, so you're, 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 you're in a moment right now politically and culturally where you're in some places you're facing a headwind. But to me, that's the work, you know, that's why it's important that you have books like Alejandra. That is telling a story, that is filling in the narrative for people. Uh, that's important work. And it can't be overstated. Uh, and it needs to be shared widely. Like people in school need to learn our stories. Uh, otherwise, I'll be honest with you, otherwise you're just reduced to stereotypes. Mm -hmm. You're reduced to drug dealers, gangbangers, quote unquote illegals, people who are like milking off the public. You're reduced to those stereotypes that are generational. Um, and that still dominate a lot of mass media today from Hollywood to hard news to publishing, et cetera. And what I'd add to that is you're reducing stereotypes on both sides of the spectrum, right? Because the stories that do get through tend to all have this kind of American dream, like kind of hallmark narrative as well. And, you know, we deserve the whole person. We deserve to be multidimensional and have nuanced stories that aren't only kind of these rags to riches stories. And so that is a part of this storytelling. And it's all of our responsibility. And it's hard sometimes to want to point to these other pieces because it's easy to get swept up in who, you who people tell you you are. And sometimes it's a positive thing. But to be like, wait, hold on. You know, there's actually more to this, more to my story than whatever narrative is convenient, you know? Yeah. Um, I just, is, I think there's a mic up there. I just want to make sure nobody's on it. So just say he hello if someone's on it. Okay, good. So I'm gonna go here, down here, and then over here for the last question. Um, Up here. Hi, my name is Jaime Espinosa. I'm a uh, first-generation Mexican-American born and raised in Los Angeles, and I'm currently a graduate student at um, the Graduate School of Design. Um, my three-part question is, are there any mentors or role models that you had while, during your time here at Harvard? 
Um, if so, what was your main takeaway from that experience? And three, uh, how did you gain the confidence to be involved and make an impact in national politics as first generation? Um, <laughs> no, I, you know, when I was an undergrad, I had a great professor who was a real mentor and kind of a shepherd through that system named Luis Fraga, who was a professor at Notre Dame in political science now. Um, when I was here, uh, no, but I, I, I had great friends. Like, um, I can't say there was one person right, that was a mentor in the same way, but had wonderful friends. And the experience, I don't know if anybody's at the law school, but the experience of going through the law school, they build it up to be a very like, you know, scary thing, competitive thing. And you know, for about the first six months or so it is, but then after that, um, it was fine. Uh, but really it was just, just being here and being able to, to be around so many great friends that I made. Uh, I made. I made better friends here with a smaller class than I did at, when I was an undergrad with a much larger class, ironically. Maybe it was because there were less people and it was easier and so forth. Um, but uh, what was the last, the second part on national politics? Uh, the second part was um, how was your mentorship experience like? And the third part was how did you gain the confidence to be involved in national politics as a first generation? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to, to, to get involved and to really want to be involved, I think you have to find something that inspires you to do that. Whatever the issue is, remember, um, people come in in politics for di in different ways. For example, without naming names, I served with a state representative who um, got into politics because his, his son had suffered a drug overdose. And that issue and that experience drove him to get into elective office. So people will find inspiration, sometimes in tragedy, obviously. Um, sometimes, you know, just you know, like myself, because I grew up in a family that was working in grassroots politics and so forth. But you, so I would say that you have to find your inspiration that, that is meaningful to you and authentic to you, and also know why you want to be in the particular office that you're in. Like, what is your, what is your reason for being there and your purpose? Absolutely, because that will sustain you because it is hard, you know, we're talking about that financial barrier and getting into politics, I didn't even touch on the fact that I, I once ran for Congress. And it was a very personal thing for me too, you know, Obamacare at the time was being threatened and I had just discovered that the reason why my great grandmother, grandmother, mom and two aunts had all had breast cancer is because we carry a hereditary cancer mu mutation called BRCA and I had just tested positive myself. And the idea around pre-existing conditions, the, around, the idea around not having the choice of being able to have a preventive surgery, which is eventually what I did, you know, that, that was something that just, I could not get, not do something to try to get in the game and, and protect that. Um, but it does sustain you through how hard that is. The fundraising was definitely the hardest part. And I almost feel like for first generation young people who, you know, we've kind of held ourselves up financially and asking for money kind of feels like extra shameful in a lot of ways. Um, that was a difficult part for me. And as a woman, which I, I talk a lot in the book about the sexism that I experienced and the the situations that you ended up being when you do kind of have your hand outstretched in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable. As far as the mentors when I was here, you know, I also found my best friends of my life while I was here to this day. But it was interesting because I really wanted to take advantage of the folks you have access to. And for my academic advisor, you kind of had a choice. And even though I was mostly interested in domestic policy, Samantha Power, the future UN ambassador, was here um, as a professor, and I wanted to have her as my academic advisor, which is what I did, and, and I found her to be totally inspirational, and she shared advice with me that really changed the way I was looking at approaching my career, and then ironically, we served in the White House together. Okay, so we're at seven o'clock that maybe we could do a rapid fire. I know we're at the end. Okay, yeah. I'm yeah, 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 oh, sorry. Because I just wanted to know, you know, when we're looking at the fact that a third of first generation students, you know, they, they're a third of college students are first generation students, but 90% don't graduate on time. I'm curious 
you know, what are the, maybe like popcorn, like what is it that people think are the reasons? Financial barriers? Family stuff. Family dynamics? Not knowing how to navigate the system. The pandemic. Mental health. Lack of confidence. All right, thank you for sharing. Um, I wonder if I could, if you guys don't mind, invite the two people left at the mics, maybe up to ask their questions to you guys directly, if you're okay with that. Sure. Great. Um, can you guys give a round of applause for, thank you guys so much for your time. Please pick up Version out now at the Harvard Bookstore, at all the bookstores, and thank you guys for coming back. Thank you.